Good evening, students, parents, and members of the community. Today is a, this evening is an important evening. I think what you're going to hear tonight from these four distinguished panelists, experts from Torrance Memorial Medical Center, is why we need to be on our toes, be alert, and be aware of the risks of this drug that is basically operating in disguise. It's operating and, and finding its way into pills in basically looking like granulars of salt and three or four or five granulars, hopefully I'm not stealing any of their thunder, uh, pressed into a pill that you think might keep you up and yet it's gonna cause you to die. Um, we have, we have reached out to a number of organizations. Santiago, if you can help me advance to the next slide. Oh, that's uh, a bit much. Um, the next one, the next one. Yeah, so the, the goal here this evening, the goal and objective is to save lives. Uh, next slide. Um, I, I love this photo. I use it in presentations I'm, um, because it inspires me uh, that our children are our future. They're looking to us while they're at the same time looking up in the sky uh, and, and dreaming of what they may be one day. Or they could be uh, wondering when they get to go trick-or-treating. But uh, our children, your future children, for those of you who are in high school right now or middle school, um, we want to keep them safe. And I want to say there, there are people all over the country, all over the world, and 529 people in the South Bay in the last four years that wish they had attended an event like this. Um, actually, before that, the, the next slide. These are some famous people that have died inadvertently, accidentally, by taking a pill they thought would do one thing, a Xanax, a Percocet, and they ended up uh, dying. Um, many of them very young, starting out in their lives, and others legends uh, in their careers, and, and they ended up losing their life. Here's several students. Cooper Davis, Christopher Currier, Kate Kitchell, Lucas Barrier, Lucas Manuel, Colin Walker. They look like kids right here in Manhattan Beach, right here in the South Bay. They all died in the last three years of fentanyl, inadvertent consumption of fentanyl. Adriana Taylor, 15, Haley Dakeman, Teslin Russell, Trinity Conejo, Kimberly Figueroa, Danila Guerrero, all died in the last three years of fentanyl. That's why we're having this team focus workshop. It's, it's to educate our youth and to educate our parents uh, to be mindful of, of the dangers that are out there uh, uh, impacting our youth and potentially impacting their futures. And so with that, I'm going to uh, get the program underway and introduce our first panelist who's a pharmacist at Torrance Memorial Medical Center. He's, I know, I think they asked me not to put doctor on, on front of their names because they like to be referred as Felix and Tammy. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Felix Pham, who's going to continue uh, with the program. Hi, my name is Felix. Uh, I'm the pharmacy clinical supervisor at Torrance Memorial Medical Center. I've been, been there for about seven years. Uh, before that, uh, I acted as a pharmacy manager over at Long Beach. Um, so I've about like 13, 14 years of tenure as a pharmacist. Um, this is certainly one of the more challenging uh, speaking events I've had, I've had to do, just because the topic is, um, is it hits home, definitely. Um, So uh, on my part, I'm going to cover what fentanyl is, 
I'm going to go over why it's so dangerous, and then just review uh, a bunch of numbers for the number junkies out there. Uh, so if you like econ like I like econ, you're in for a treat. <laughs> and, and if you fall asleep, I will spray the locks on you. So I'm So some of the basics we're going to go over. Sorry. All right. Oops. That was way too much. Santiago, assist. Backtrack. Uh, here we go. So here we go. Thanks. Some of the basics that we want to go over is, um, you know, just high points and just very plainly looking at um, fentanyl. Um, fentanyl essentially is heroin. Right? It's an opioid, it acts exactly like ha heroin, it's highly addictive. Um, when you measure fentanyl, it's in micrograms. Um, so just as a, uh, an example, you see the, the pencil that's pictured here? At the tip of the pencil, there's, um, there's just a few grains of fentanyl, and that, that's enough to overdose a person, a full adult person. Um, who has not been exposed to opioids in the past, uh, or drugs like that. Um, so the thing about fentanyl is it helps to alleviate pain, but the other thing that it does is it also decreases your ability to um, make a respiration or breathe. So, um, you know, in the medical field, we, we use this very carefully um, and skillfully to provide palliation to our patients who absolutely need them but in a way that doesn't stop their breathing. Um, and uh, so you can, and, uh, just to exemplify, this is 100 times more potent than morphine um, uh, or heroin. So the opioid epidemic starts around the 2000s. And this is where I get into the numbers. And this is the first wave of our opioid crisis. And if you subscribe to Netflix, then you can watch this, <laughs> this documentary, this, uh, what is it? It's a dramatized documentary um, about Purdue Pharma and how they pushed opioids out into the public and how appalling it, it, it was to do those things. Um, when I was in pharmacy school, they taught me exactly what Purdue Pharma told us that these long-acting opioids were not addictive, um, that were, were less addictive, and that we should be moving towards that rather than the short-acting opioids. The current stance is that it's flipped, and the consequence is that there were many lives that were, sa were sacrificed because of what Purdue Pharma's actions were. And there's huge lawsuits and litigations that are currently in play, um, but that's not actually the end of our opioid epidemic. Wave two. So you have the DEA, the FDA chiming in and um, tightening the screws on any opioids that are coming out of pharmacies, hospitals, anywhere. So if, if it's being manufactured and um, uh, uh, distributed through the healthcare industry, the screws were tightened. And so the patients who were hooked on uh, prescription opioids went to heroin, and then you saw the second wave, the heroin overdoses. Um, and, then, and then came the rise of the, the fentanyl epidemic. Um, so fentanyl became more widely used because it was so small and easy to carry and uh, yeah, um, distribute. So its effects were just as potent, and yet it was easier to transport and smuggle. And so, it, so that's the third wave. And um, since the advent of the third wave, uh, our government, who's slow to respond, <laughs> uh, had put out some white papers um, and then provided uh, monetary support to help with the opioid epidemic. But that wasn't enough. Can you tell us what the photo is? Oh, I'm sorry. It's on the bottom left. So the green line 
um, represents prescription opioid-related deaths. The purple line represents heroin-related deaths. And the blue line represents uh, the, the fentanyl-related uh, deaths without any other substances. The red line, and you'll see, is fentanyl with other substances. So in wave four, so this is where we are right now. You have fentanyl overdoses with and without other substances. Now if you just put fentanyl right at the top, this would be double, it would be off the chart, um, and it's a catastrophe. So uh, the dangers here, so that I wanted to exemplify again, highly addictive substance, ideal for sprinkling it on to a different substance of abuse, whereby it will hook you if you say take cocaine. So you might be thinking you're in for a cocaine ride, right? But then you take the, the fentanyl with it. Right? And that would either hook you or kill you, pick your poison. Um, I'm sorry, this keeps advancing. Um, The next slide. Yeah, that's. I wanted to stick on this slide. This one? Yeah, this one. Right. Okay. So um, the other things are that uh, the um, uh, the illicit uh, manufacturing of stimulants in combination with this was highly attractive to uh, drug dealers who were pushing out, you know, these stimulants. So a stimulant is like cocaine or methamphetamine. But that's not where it stops. You can also see it in other drugs of abuse as well. You can um, see it also laced in um, uh, marijuana and you know other drugs of abuse that you can find on the streets. Um, so this this slide is from the CDC, um, and I like to to exemplify this slide because um, I'm a, I'm a bit of a pessimist, half glass uh, glass half empty. And periodically, I'll peek on the CDC, and I go to um, I go to the section where it shows uh, causes of death, and I look for the, the age range that belongs to my children, and I and I just wonder, like, okay, so what are my kids up against these days? Now, my kids are not between 15 and 24. I mean, I look 15 and 24. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I don't have to worry about this right now in this moment, but. For all those with children between the ages of 15 and 24, raise your hands. That's what your kids are against. Your kids are against accidental poisoning from narcotic substances. So the DEA did put out a safety alert to the public, and they showcased that six out of every 10 laced, fentanyl laced uh, illicit drug uh, had an amount that was enough to make a patient or a person overdose. Um, so what that would look like um, is uh, it would it may look like a counterfeit prescription. So uh, what you may think is an oxycontin is not an oxycontin. It'll look exactly like what the uh, manufacturers um, produce the, who produce the prescription pills will look like. Um, uh, I, I talked briefly about um, about uh, combining it with stimulants. They call that speedballing. In New York, it's typically uh, in, in, the, in the East Coast, the northeastern uh, area of the United States, it's usually combined with cocaine. Down here in the southwestern region, it's usually combined with methamphetamine. And then with that, um, I wanted to pass the torch on to Dr. Benjamin. This is on testing. Okay, good. I'm going to come down here so um, I can get in your face and make sure you don't fall asleep because I have a lot to say. <laughs> so I'm going to mix it up. Hopefully I won't fall. 
Maybe I'll advance the slide while I'm walking to distract you. <laughs> okay, that's for me. Okay, so I guess this is what I'm talking about here. I'm going to just set this down and put on my white coat so I look official. Thank you. All right, stop. All right, so I'm Dr. Gretchen Lentz, and I'm a board certified emergency physician, and I work at Toronto Memorial Emergency Room. And so, like many of you, I started off in Manhattan Beach. I was born and raised in Manhattan Beach, California. I was a Pacific Panther, like many of you as well. We moved to the South Bay, and then I went to UC Santa Barbara, where I played soccer for the Gauchos. And then I went to medical school in New York City, and I was in New York City for about 10 years, and that's when I decided to be in emergency positions, when I decided to specialize in emergencies. And I figured a pretty good place to learn about emergencies was the Bronx, and so that's where I did my residency, and I was right. I learned about a lot of emergencies there. I stayed on as a teaching professor for a couple years back in New York and decided it was time to come home to my roots. And so now I'm back in the South Bay. I've been at Torrance Memorial for about 15 years now. I've been the medical director for the emergency group for a handful of years, and I have four young children in the community. And I really take a lot of pride in working in the community that I love. So I appreciate you letting me get here and talk with you. Um, so fentanyl, it's a problem. You guys know it's a problem, that's why we're here, right? I'm going to talk to you about my perspective as a physician and as a mother about fentanyl, and then not just identifying the problems, but also identifying some of the solutions that I recommend, and that's what we're really all here for, right? So, um, emergency department, that's my home. This is my second home working in the emergency room. And um, the, so another name for the emergency room, sometimes people call it the ER, but it's not really one room anymore. It's very much more complicated than that. Has anybody heard of the term A and E before? Does anybody know what A and E stands for? You can yell it out. That's why I'm making sure you're not following. That's why I'm here, so I can call on you. <laughs> anybody know A and E? I see somebody back there. Somebody, yell out A and E. Nobody knows what A and E stands for. You guys are boxing. Architecture and engineering. <laughs> okay, no. no. Close, Randy. Thank you for trying. Uh, so A and E stands for, um, I guess it's my way. We're going to jump up. Okay, there we go. Accident and emergency. Okay? So they, a lot of other countries I think they call the A&E department, but so accident and emergency. And certainly in the emergency department we see... Oops, am I going back? Oh, anyway. So the problem is accidents happen. Problem number one, right? Accidents happen. We all know that that happens, right? So, um... We see plenty of accidents in the emergency room. Um... So why do accidents happen? I know this is, we're not getting a lot of participation, so I'll just jump ahead. But so accidents happen, we all know why they happen. We've had accidents, right? Um, inexperience, recklessness, aggression, distraction, ignorance, all that kind of stuff. So I've determined over my career <laughs> two big things, right? Bad luck and bad decisions. So um, I've learned over my many years in the room that one of the problems is humans make bad decisions. That's just the way we're wired. We do it, there's no way around it, we make bad decisions. So for example, eating a plate of donuts. We know it's not a good decision, we might do it anyway, and then we might pay the consequences, right? So your bad decisions, you might end up in the emergency department, vomiting with an upset stomach, and we'll solve the problem. That's just the way it's gonna go, it's okay, we'll take care of it, right? And so other bad decisions, what is the person doing in this picture? Texting while driving. This isn't a bad decision, this is a terrible decision. A terrible decision. So I beg all of you, all of you, <laughs> if you see your friends doing it, if you see your parents doing it, Beg them, please, do not text and drive, because what will happen, you can end up getting distracted and hurting yourself and hurting another driver, and if you don't die instantly or kill them, you might both end up seeing me in the emergency department, right? So here is another bad decision, right? Firecrackers on the 4th of July. We all know it's not a great decision. We do it anyway. People come and visit me in the emergency room every 4th of July, and you don't have to be a radiologist or even a doctor to know that part of that <laughs> should be on the other part. It happens. Bad decisions are human nature, right? So here's another one, uh, drinking games, right? We all know what drinking games, right? We're, we're, I think we can collectively all sit here in this church with our pastor, with our parents, and decide this is a terrible idea. It happens anyway. And you might end up poisoned and coming to me in the emergency room and um, end up you know, very, very sick from alcohol um, poisoning. So that's another bad decision that humans make. It's just part of our nature. 
um, and we'll deal with that. So in addition to uh, these, obviously wh why we're here today is another bad decision is taking fentanyl or any street drugs because those can either bring you to me if you're lucky or if not, they can kill you before you can make it to the emergency room. So um, the solution, you know, you can't really change bad luck, but you can certainly change um, behaviors and uh, fix bad decisions. So basically, you know, being aware that these are probably bad decisions and trying to make better ones just with education and conversations. So next, I want to kind of pivot to talk about the, the teen brain a little bit. Your brain is different than my brain, and your brain is different than your mom's brain and your grandma's brain. Teens' brains were wired very differently. And this is why it's sometimes difficult communicating. It's just because it's not the same, right? So the teenage brain is um, it's tantalized by risk. It loves taking risks. It's rewarded by risks. The teen brain, um, you know, the, the reward um, uh, chemical dopamine goes off when a teenager takes risks. And the teen brain makes way more dopamine than child brains and adult brains, so it's really the perfect storm that um, a teen brain just is um, excited to take risks. And so, obviously, this is, um, sorry, let me go back if I can. So this is a problem, right? Teen brains loving risk is a problem. But this is, we're designed this way for a reason. You know, you gotta jump out of the nest. You have to try new things. This is evolutionary. But the problem is, like, there's dangers outside the nest. And so the risky behavior can get teens in problems. So, uh, to add to that, the teenage brain um, has an underdeveloped prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is like the common sense part of our brain. That's what makes us make rational decisions, that's what helps us um, make judgments, that's what, how we decide what consequences might happen to our actions. It's a rational thinking part of the brain, and this doesn't really fully develop until you're the age 25. So, um, the consequence of this, um, you know, prefrontal cortex being underdeveloped is you're impulsive. You just make decisions without thinking about the consequences. This is physiology. It's not your teenager not thinking. It's just that's the way their brain works, right? So here we have a combination of a brain that loves to take risk and a brain that loves to be impulsive and doesn't think about consequences. Uh, the perfect storm, right? So, but wait, <laughs> there's more. The teen brain, instead of thinking with this prefrontal cortex, instead thinks with a uh, part of the brain called the amygdala. And it might not surprise you to learn that the amygdala is the emotional center of the brain. So teens, instead of making rational decisions, are making emotional decisions. And so, um, so we have the trifecta, right? We have br brains that love risk, we have a um, brain that doesn't think about actions and acts impulsively and also thinks emotionally. What could possibly go wrong, right? So that's what we're dealing with in our, in our teens, right? Um, so the solution, you know, you, how can you fix the, the teen brain? You just have to recognize what we're dealing with, right? You have to realize that, um, that they're, uh, be aware of just kind of the differences and think a little bit more before you act, pause before you act, and really have to think ahead about the potential consequences of your actions. And you're just gonna have to practice that until you become 25. <laughs> so the community, this is tough because it feels like sacrilege talking about this, but what is the community's part in the fentanyl crisis? Because, you know, it's all multifactorial. And so in the community here, um, you know, it's- I do not have an available, I wanna be ready for that situation. I would have never thought, so it is in our backyard. Um, I have a, a video to show um, on what you need to know. So, but first, let me just go over. Um, you do want to check the expiration date. So the one we're handing out is in March of 2026, so it'll last a good long time. You do want to store it at room temperature. Um, we did talk a little bit about the side effects. Go for this one. Um, want to go ahead and show the video? Just let the play button. I'm gonna have it to you, Felix. Felix is my IT guru. You got it. You got it. You got it. You got it. You have to EQ up the sound. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jennifer Whitney. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist with a practice that focuses on addiction. 
I have seen firsthand what the use of opioids can do to individuals and families. The California Department of Public Health works to protect the public's health in the Golden State and help shape positive health outcomes for individuals, families, and communities. As part of this mission, the department is implementing a comprehensive approach to address opioid misuse and prevent overdoses. The purpose of this video is to support these efforts by providing information on opioid use, the signs of an overdose, and how to use the life-saving drug, naloxone. In this video, you'll learn how to prevent an overdose, how to recognize an opioid overdose, including how to check responsiveness, how to store and administer naloxone, how to alert emergency medical services, how to administer rescue breathing, how to place the subject in the recovery position, and how to provide post-overdose care. Before we talk about how to recognize and respond to an overdose, let's take a quick look at what opioids are and what puts people at risk of an overdose. Opioids are among the world's oldest known drugs, typically used for the relief of pain. Some of the most common forms today include oxycodone, hydrocodone, methadone, heroin, and fentanyl. Naloxone is an effective and safe medication. Naloxone acts as an opioid antagonist or blocker, which can reverse an opioid overdose. Naloxone is not addictive and cannot cause harm to anyone, including those not suffering from an opioid overdose. Naloxone is easy to use. This training will discuss the various forms of naloxone and prepare you to use them. Always be sure to carefully read the instructions that come with each naloxone product, including how to properly store naloxone, which is usually at room temperature. But before we talk about how to use naloxone, we need to talk about the signs of an overdose and how to tell the difference between someone who is high or sedated and someone who may be suffering an overdose. Many overdoses are due to a combination of an opioid and other drugs, such as alcohol, benzodiazepines, and sleeping aids. In addition to mixing drugs, other factors can contribute to the risk of overdose. These include variation in strength and purity of the drug used, switching the mode of administration, for example, a change from snorting to injecting, lower tolerance after a period of abstinence, low tolerance from lack of prior use, using the drug alone, and physical health. In your interactions with those who use opioids, you may have opportunities to suggest strategies which can help them reduce their risk of an overdose. These include knowing their tolerance, knowing their supply, controlling their own high, being aware of the risks of mixing drugs, not using alone, or having a trusted friend to check on them, having a plan, talking with others, and using drug testing resources, such as fentanyl test strips, if possible. Not all strategies will be appealing to people, but engaging them in an honest dialogue about their use can be very beneficial. The symptoms of someone who is higher sedated but not suffering an overdose include relaxed muscles, slow or slurred speech, looking sleepy or nodding out, will respond to stimulation such as yelling, sternum rub, or pinching. Now on the other hand, someone who's suffering an overdose will usually exhibit some or all of the following symptoms. Deep snoring, gurgling or wheezing, blue or grayish skin tinge, usually the lips or fingertips darken first, pale, clammy skin. The person will not respond to stimulation, and the breathing is very slow and irregular or has stopped and the pulse is faint. These symptoms occur because opioids cause respiratory depression or reduced respiratory function, resulting in increased levels of carbon dioxide and decreased levels of oxygen in the body. When breathing stops, the lack of oxygen can cause brain damage, and if the oxygen supply is not restored, the heart will stop, resulting in death. Here is the six-point checklist you should follow in the event of an overdose. First, check responsiveness. If unresponsive, administer naloxone, then call 911. While waiting for emergency medical services to respond, administer rescue breathing. If you are trained in cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR, this technique can also be used. Place the person in the recovery position, and finally, administer aftercare. 
If you suspect an overdose, check responsiveness. You can do this in several ways, by rubbing their sternum in the upper chest area, by yelling at them, or pinching them. If there's no response, you should administer naloxone immediately. Make sure that you've studied the instructions in your naloxone rescue kit. There are four common naloxone products. Nasal spray, like the one we're using today, Narcan, which needs no assembly. Nasal spray from a syringe type applicator, which requires assembly. An auto injector, which can deliver a dose into the outer thigh, even through clothing. An injectable naloxone from a vial via a syringe. For the Narcan nasal spray that we're using, hold the device with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and two fingers on either side of the nozzle. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under their neck with your other hand. Place the tip of the nozzle in one nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of their nose. Press the plunger firmly to place the full dose into their nose. If after two minutes the person is still unresponsive, you can give a second dose in the alternate nostril using a new device. Administering a second dose before two minutes are up is a common mistake as people often panic. While this won't cause any serious side effects, it may exacerbate the withdrawal symptoms that come with the naloxone rescue. We'll talk more about this when we get to aftercare. If possible, have someone call 911 as soon as you've determined the person is unresponsive. If no one is available to do this, call 911 immediately after you've administered naloxone. Whoever calls 911 should state that the person is not breathing, is unresponsive, and that you suspect a possible overdose. The caller and the person administering naloxone are protected from any liabilities by California Good Samaritan laws. Once you've administered naloxone and called 911, begin rescue breathing. If you're trained in CPR and feel comfortable doing it, you can also include this technique. Rescue breathing is one of the most important steps in preventing an overdose death. Place the person on their back, place your hand under their neck, and tilt their chin up. Make sure that the person's airway is clear so air can get into their lungs by checking to see if there's anything in their mouth blocking their airway, such as gum, pills, or food. If so, remove it. Use a mouth shield or breathing mask when performing rescue breathing if you have one to reduce your exposure to other possible health risks. Placing one hand on the forehead, pinch the nose to prevent air from escaping out of the nose. Take a breath, cover the mouth with your own, and breathe out. You'll see the chest rise as it fills with air. Repeat this at five second intervals. If possible, stay on the phone with EMS dispatch until the emergency response crew arrives at the scene. Once you've determined that the person has emerged from the overdose and is breathing regularly, place them in the recovery position to prevent aspiration or choke, tilting their head back to open the airway. People wake up from an overdose differently, and while violent reactions are rare and are usually associated with being given, we would rather you give it than not. It is, again, the same treatment if someone is unconscious that we will use in the emergency room, so whether it's we don't know the source of someone's unconsciousness. It is a, in our treatment line to give it. So it could be a glucose, a sugar problem. It could be some other reason that they're not responsive, but it is in our arsenal to use it. So use it. That's number one. Number two is it's short acting. So they do still need to get to a provider. Um, there is two nasal sprays that you'll receive in that box. So sometimes it's necessary, like you said, to give that second dose um, in the nostril on the other side after about two minutes to see if that first dose can have its effect. Um, sometimes people who are very, very highly addictive, all I can remember is they come out angry that you've taken their high away. Um, so again, use it. Doesn't do any good sitting in a box. We can always replace it. If it, if, it, if it didn't pan out, that's fine. You can always get another one. So please um, feel free. It's there for your use. I'm gonna hand this over to Carol. She's gonna go over some of the resources that we have available. Thank you, Dr. Wendler. Hi, my name's Carol. Well done. I'm the substance use navigator at Torrance Memorial Hospital. So if anybody comes into the hospital um, with a fentanyl overdose, 
Um, I'm the one that will uh, help the doctor um, see the patient and get them started on buprenorphine, the um, suboxone. And then I'm the one that will help them get into a MAT treatment program. MAT is medication-assisted treatment um, because the patient will need to continue uh, using buprenorphine, a suboxone, to uh, deal with their addiction. Um, it solves the addiction. It's another just magical medication that works instantly. And uh, we, we see it quite a lot in the emergency department. Um, so if you know anybody that has a problem, you can send them in to us and we will get them started on the uh, buprenorphine uh, suboxone and help them get their lives back to normal. Um, and let's start. So first off, no one needs to die from an opioid overdose. We now have the Narcan. So, um, but the main reason um, is if you use alone um, with nobody around to supervise your use, you will die from a fentanyl overdose. So, I want to show you this photo. Um, this is Russell. Uh, Russell was the love of my life and he overdosed from fentanyl three and a half years ago. So I lost the man that I adored to a fentanyl overdose. Um, and again, the tragedy is that no one needs to die because we have these medications. But he was alone, and there was nobody there to give him the Narcan and save his life. Um, he made a fatal mistake, and he used drugs once in more than 10 years and he was gone in an instant. He'd worked really hard on his recovery. I met him in 2010 in a drug and alcohol program. I was an intern, he was a patient. And um, so it was just incredibly shocking how fast it happened and uh, poof, he was gone. So the story is all about trauma, trauma, trauma. Um, he suffered from chronic PTSD, complex trauma, and medication-resistant depression. He had a history of complex trauma from age 10 to 11. Um, and then the definition of complex trauma is uh, it happens during the developmental stage, uh, during childhood or adolescence. Um, so like Brussels trauma. Um, and then there's simple trauma, which is what most of us will experience in our lives. Complex trauma is extremely difficult to deal with. It usually occurs uh, not just once, but over a long period of time, as in Russell's case. Again, he was 10. Uh, simple trauma can be processed, processed and healed with time, and happens when we break a bone, have a breakup, or experience situational depression, like when we lose someone we love experience anxiety from exams. Uh, there will come a time in our lives when we feel the need to numb our intense emotions and then Xanax looks attractive. Um, but because of fentanyl, we're all at risk and the consequences are now irreversible and fatal. Uh, Russell's tremendous emotional pain made it impossible for him to handle complex, the, his complex trauma without using drugs and alcohol. So this gives you an idea of what people with addictions uh, are dealing with. Basically, um, they're all they're all traumatized children that couldn't handle these um, intense um, pain, this intense pain, without using drugs and alcohol to numb their emotions. Uh, when I met Russell in 2010, he was sober and stayed that way for about five glorious years, long enough for us to fall in love. And as I said, when he overdosed on fentanyl, it was the first time in 10 years that he had used drugs and it happened to be fentanyl. And I'm sure he didn't know. He probably thought it was cocaine and it was this. I don't know what was going through his head. It was a momentary fatal mistake. And um, he 
said every time he asked for help, he went to a doctor, or therapist, or recovery program. Uh, they wanted to know the details of his trauma, which we triggered him every time, which shows that you know medical, a lot of the medical profession and therapeutic profession doesn't really understand trauma. So we take traumatized people and re-traumatize them and wonder why they don't get better. Um, so they have traumatized people have uh, deep emotional problems they can't resolve on their own. That's why they use drugs and alcohol. Um, some of the doctors say, don't bother helping them. It's no good. Um, they're hopeless. They're just going to keep coming back. But um, it shows that there are, you know, some of our doctors are not really trained in addressing emotional pain. And even psychologists and therapists are not trained in addressing emotional pain. They're trained instead to change the behavior and use behavior modification. Uh, the question they should be asking is, well, what are you carrying inside that's making you behave this way? Um, Gabor Mate, seminal thinker in the field of addiction medicine, says addiction is not a choice. He says it's a response to human suffering. Um, most, if not all, the patients I've worked with since 2010 have suffered from trauma, physical trauma, from car accidents, broken bones, dental pain, football accident, back pain, or emotional pain, uh, childhood sexual abuse, neglect, abandonment, and domestic violence. And again, addiction is an attempt to escape their suffering, albeit temporarily. So again, what we're seeing are traumatized children, which are probably all of the you know, homeless, mentally ill people we see on our streets. And traumatized children who are self-medicating with drugs and alcohol because they can't accept the pain they're in. Um, about 50% of the patients I've seen since 2010 were prescribed opiate pain medication by their doctors for these various physical um, traumas. And the patients developed uh, dependence and were subsequently taken off the pain meds by their doctors. And then the patients turned to drug dealers for their um, illicit medications because they couldn't get the prescribed meds. So, or else they would experience brutal withdrawal symptoms where they felt like they were dying. Uh, fentanyl is an equal opportunity killer. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Um, one of my colleagues showed Prince on the screen. Uh, Prince was this amazing, brilliant musician. He amassed a fortune from his music career. And he was prescribed fentanyl as a painkiller from years of dancing on stage. Uh, he probably needed hip replacements, but instead he got addicted to using fentanyl as a painkiller. He overdosed alone, and his money did not save him. Uh, Tom Petty, another incredible musician, uh, was prescribed fentanyl amongst other painkillers. And for a shoulder injury, he sustained while on stage. I think it was a broken collarbone. He overdosed. His money didn't save him. And every day we see more names added to the list of celebrities, musicians, actors, football players, athletes, all overdosing on fentanyl or a mix of fentanyl and benzodiazepines or other drugs. Um, what can we do? The solution is talking about it, like we're doing now. Carry Narcan in your pocket and in your purse. Buy the fentanyl test strips that cost about a dollar online, or you can get them from free from harm reduction programs. And uh, again, there's the Don't Use Alone hotline, which uh, Dr. Lynn mentioned. And then having friends and family to talk to about our pain, our trauma, these are all essential tools to saving lives in these difficult times we suddenly find ourselves in. Um, the time to hide drug use is over. We have to talk about it, or we're going to lose more loved ones to pain pills, fentanyl, cocaine, and other opiates, and alcohol, all because we didn't talk about it. We didn't have this conversation. Um, Let's see, the hotline I never use alone. Um, okay. So these guys are, um, this is you two. So I went to school with them. Let's see, there, that's me and Bono in the middle. He's in the black sweater, I'm in the flowery top. So when we were in school, um, well, I guess I started drinking around 18, they started playing instruments. They couldn't play yet. And, uh, but they just kept practicing and practicing and practicing. 
and eventually they got better and better and better. And now there you have built an empire. They're the, I think, second um, richest band in rock history. So I guess my advice for a solution would be follow your bliss, practice your art, whatever it is. It could be neurobiology, go to med school, it could be writing, it could be music. And follow your bliss and just uh, create your empire. Um, and let's see, I would also suggest starting a harm reduction group, a uh, support group. Start a sober dance, dance it out. Uh, don't buy anything online. And remember the number one killer for 18 to 46 year olds is fentanyl overdose. Uh, and as I said, find out what turns you on. And I don't mean the hottie sits next to you in math or English. Find out what excites your brain and it's not getting high or drunk. Again, maybe it's the music or the writing. And carry an Arcan, don't use, and if you do, don't use alone, use with supervision. Uh, this is a resource list, and we have a bigger resource list at the back. Um, and as I mentioned, when I was in my YouTube first started playing, I was drinking and smoking, and, and I wrote this poem inspired by Solange. Um, I tried to drink it away, but it wouldn't go away. I tried to smoke it away, and it wouldn't go away. I even tried to sniff it away, and it still wouldn't go away. Finally, I figured out I could dance it away, I could sing it away, I could swim it away, row it away. I could run it away, drum it away, I could write it away, meditate it away, I could yoga it away, I could even spoke and work it away, and keep it at bay, one day at a time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause to our distinguished panel. I know we're all going to leave after the Q&A. We're going to move to the Q&A right now. But uh, much more informed of the dangers of this very uh, lethal drug, fentanyl. And I, I want to mention that one of the scariest things about it is, you know, I think many of us will remember that uh, sometimes when you're, when you've taken your kids out trick-or-treating, there have been people that have put things in candy and, and you're, people become fearful, and that's how we move to trick-or-treating in malls instead of certain neighborhoods, because there was a fear that you might take eat a Snickers bar or, or a popcorn uh, candy of some sort, and, and have, it would have something in it that could hurt your kid. But now we seem to have these drugs that, I, I mean, the, just the scariest part about it is that it's in disguise. And you could literally think you're taking a Xanax you're out of your mom's medicine cabinet or, or somebody showing you one that looks just like one that's from a prescription bottle and it's, it's the end and your life is over. And uh, I think that, that's why I wanted to be involved in this and, and come out here and be part of sharing this information uh, this evening. You were each given a, either a green or a blue card. Uh, the blue cards are for adults or parents to have written down their questions. The green cards are for the youth or students to, uh, to uh, put your questions down. You can either pass those to me or you can feel free to move up to the, um, these mics or we'll bring them to you and, uh, and ask the question for you. Are there any... Anybody have any questions? Any cards you'd like to pass? Okay, you have. So as, as we're uh, starting our Q&A session, um, after the Q&A session, we are giving away the uh, Narcan boxes. There are two doses per box. And I have uh, Justin, our intern pharmacist. He'll be a pharmacist next year. I wanted him to join us on the panelists to help uh, answer some Q&A. 
Um, so if you wanted to welcome Justin. Thank you, Justin. I, I actually have a question. My wife and I have earthquake kits, first aid kits, in each of our vehicles and in our garage. So we have three. Um, would a Narcan survive in the trunk of a vehicle in in a hundred degree, hundred you know, inside a trunk it can get very hot. So sounds like a pharmacy question, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so there is uh, upper and lower limits to storing medications. Um, inside the trunk of a vehicle, uh, it would be too hot, especially in a Cal in the California sun. Um, so it could reach up to 100 degrees in your car. Um, so it would not be op optimal to store it there. Yeah. Um, it could deactivate the drug um, and cause it to be uh, not known when you use it. Thank you, doctor. Okay, we have our first question is from a student or youth. His question is, or her question, is why is it important to learn about fentanyl if you're not even 13? <laughs> I, I'm 12 years old. So I'm not even a teen. That's a really good question. Um, whoever asked it, this, thank you for asking that, being the brave thing that out there. Because you're not always going to be 12 or 13, right? You're growing, and each day you're going to start experiencing new things and new temptations and new risks. And it's not just you alone, right? You have friends, too, that you can educate. So the fact that you're here tonight learning this information about a big kid topic, you're going to be able to share and tell your friends what you learned today and share it with them. And someday, this information is going to be very important to you. Um, I wanted to add to that. Um, at 13, you have no idea what dangers lie ahead of you. Um, and you think that what you heard in school or what you hear here would help identify what it looks like to be pressured to use a party drug or to get engaged with, or to experiment with drugs, then you would be strong enough to say no. But I've been there, and at 13, it's really hard, you know, um, and you just don't know what you're up against. Learn about it now, talk about it now, be open to have a discussion with your parents now. Thank you, Doctor. This is for Dr. Lynch. Should I administer Narcon regardless on an unresponsive person to cover all bases. If you have Narcan, I would use it on somebody that's unresponsive. You can kind of guess the situation, right? If it's a teenager that's down and they have some, you know, party gear around them, you might guess that they've overdosed on a narcotic. Um, if it's an elderly person that's at the bottom of the stairs, you can guess maybe it's not an overdose on Narcan. But using just your best judgment in a situation of it. It looks like the situation fits. There is no downside to administering Narcan. If you use it and it was a big waste, come see me, I'll give you more. I don't think there's any reason to withhold it. And call 911, and if they aren't breathing, if they don't have a pulse, you can initiate CPR if you know how to do that. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Well, because each of you have full-time jobs, either during the day or for the night shift, I presume, uh, this question is, what inspired you to speak on fentanyl? What do you hope is a takeaway from this talk? And what can an average person do to help? And what's the most important thing to know about fentanyl? So that's a four-parter. <laughs> Any one of you want to take that? What, what inspired you to take time out of your otherwise, I'm sure, busy schedules uh, to come here tonight and speak to the members of our community. It's the crisis, right? Felix showed us that slide and everybody gasped. You know, it's a crisis out there. and People are dying, you know, 150 a day in our country from fentanyl. And children just like yours and just like you, teens, um, their lives are being taken away. And it's tragic and it's avoidable and it's really important for you know, everybody to know about it. And so it's a no-brainer to take my time to try to educate everybody I can to um, know the dangers and to um, avoid the risks. Because I'm sure from the knowledge tonight, you guys can save lives. So um, it makes it worth it. Very good. Yes, thank you.
everybody has to have, everybody has to carry Narcan uh, because of uh, what I experienced losing Russell to Gamble. And the other message that I'm on a mission to spread is that don't use, but if you or somebody you know does use, you cannot use alone. You have to have somebody there to supervise your use, or you have to call that 800 number, never use alone. Because if you use alone, you will die. I think just this week, uh, Felix and I had a conversation about a, a, a baby who was crawling on the ground of a preschool. And previous to that, somebody had visited left narcotics on a bag on the floor. That baby just walking through that pathway, whether they put their fingers in their mouth or it was absorption through the skin, is no longer with us. So I can see myself traveling with another family. I can see that happening in a hotel. It, you never know when something, it, it may not be you personally, but it could be around you, even. And so I think that's just the preparedness that you can have, is what I think the message also is. Like, it may not feel close to home. You yourself are like, I'm not a drug user. My friends aren't drug users. But you never know when you're going to encounter this or be in a place where you might get it. And the dose for a baby be the same? Would a dose for a baby be the same? Yes. Okay. I think the second part of this, is, go ahead, go ahead. So um, my, my reason for being out here and speaking about, you know, you know, using my licensure, leveraging my, uh, my uh, uh, experience is uh, for purely selfish reasons. I love my kids and I just see a world of hurt out there that my kids are just going to go right, you know, running right into. And I know that the drug dealers and the um, uh, illicit fentanyl use can stop if we stop it. If we're all armed with the knowledge um, of how dangerous fentanyl is, if we talk to our children, if we get them to stop, then the drugs will stop. Because then they'll have no one to sell to. Uh, that, that's my reason. Yeah, this second part, the what can an average person do, I'm going to try to go ahead and answer that. And that is that I think everybody here should leave with two of those boxes of Narcan because you never know whether your neighbor is going to come knock on your door in a panic. And if you can get there in 30 seconds and, and you've got that, that uh, Narcan in your kitchen ready to sprint and save a life, you know, what a great thing that would be. And so I think that's... Uh, that's really important. Um, okay, this is uh, from another student or youth. It, it, is social pressure the number one cause of fentanyl use among teens? And if not, what is? So they have shown the statistics that even a uh, individual, if they have been prescribed even a medication under the age of 18, the propensity to use later is much, much greater. So for example, if you've had dental work, which I think all of us have, and you received a prescription, you were technically at risk for an addiction. Um, so I think that propensity, it's the uh, need. Um, I hope that answers. Yeah. Okay, another uh, youth question. Can fentanyl be laced and found in vaping? Absolutely. There was a slide that was up there, the 13-year-old, and for our 13-year-old who asked the question, some 13-year-olds are experimenting with different drugs. So um, if you're just going to be vaping you know, a, a regular nicotine product, I suspect that, that you're going to purchase at a licensed facility. I think that you're probably going to be okay. But if you're going to be vaping things that have any illicit drugs in it or um, street drugs, including marijuana, there's a chance that there's fentanyl in it and there's a chance that you could die the first time you try it. Okay, this is from a, a parent. Uh, should I put the Narcan in my teenager's purse? Absolutely. Put two in there. That's a Backpacks. good idea. A Gym good. bags. It can save your friend's life. There's another one, how can 
more be done at the border to identify fentanyl? It's probably a law enforcement question. <laughs> Um, yeah, slightly beyond the scope of our ability to control, but, you know, there's no amount of walls you can put up or security that you can put up that would keep the smuggling of micrograms of fentanyl across the border. And that's, that's the dangerous thing. But if we arm ourselves with the knowledge, the Narcan boxes, um, and to know not to use, or if you're going to use, don't use alone. Those are the ways that we can protect ourselves. Thank you, doctor. This is, what is trank? Trank? The tranquilizer? Uh, the tranquil, sure. That's, um, I think it's a pharmaceutical grade um, medication that is now um, becoming much more popular across the country. Um, I think it started in the Northeast, the Southeast, now it's making its way westward. It's not necessarily related to fentanyl. It can sometimes be confused with a fentanyl overdose, and we will treat it with Narcan the best we can, but the only way to really treat that medication is with supportive care. So if somebody's not breathing, we'll put them on a ventilator. If their blood pressure is low, we'll give them medication. So it's really something at this point that we don't even really have routine detection for. You'd have to send the uh, lab test to I think the Mayo Clinic, and it would take weeks to come back. So we just have to assume maybe that's what someone ingested and support them the best we can and hope that they metabolize the drug. And, um... So on fentanyl, unknowingly, having not consumed drugs, but either environmental or, or being drugged by someone else. So I don't know on the top of my head the percentage of patients that I see um, who unwittingly um, took a drug that was laced with fentanyl. Um, I'd have to kind of look more at uh, national statistics to give you that answer. In my personal experience, a number of times, you know, the patients that I typically see, sometimes they're not really able to have a conversation with me, and that information will come out later. Um, so, you know, the you know kind of the post hoc information is where we might tease out that information. Um, but it happens; we see it all the time. I would say that probably the majority of the emergencies that we see in our community are probably alcohol related. Um, but we do see um, a tremendous amount of other um, use disorders, including you know methamphetamines and stimulants like cocaine. Um, you know we see overdoses from ecstasy, and we do see fentanyl, we do see opiates, and sometimes we don't know. So maybe it's trying for other street drugs, but um, we just do our best to support the patients and keep them alive, and through the get you know, discharge from the hospital. Thank you, doctor. Okay, this is from another uh, student, youth. Why do why do I have to learn about it if I know I'll never do it? Because I promised my mom I wouldn't. I'm 13. You know, I, I have a, I a five-year-old, and um, she listens to me right now. And um, she said to me, um, she said to me just the other day, she said, Dad, I'm, I'm never going to talk back to you. I'm always going to listen to you. And I, I was in a dream. Because <laughs> even though she said that, I looked at her and I said, you know, one day, one day you're going to change your mind. And so even though you're 13 and you've got all of this fantastic intention to be the best kid you want to be for your parents, just know you're human too. You know, uh, Dr. Lenz said it well. Good people can make one bad mistake. Uh, knowing about this um, means that that 13-year-old um, can save a life. Um, that's probably the most important reason to educate yourself is um, somebody it goes unconscious at a party um, or it's, you know, anywhere. It can happen anywhere. Just assume that it's um, fentanyl and um, grab the Narcan that you have in your pocket or your purse and um, administer it. Um, it's not, not going to hurt, even if it's not fentanyl. It can only save their life. Yeah, I think similar to CPR. Those that know CPR, have been trained in CPR, you can save a life. And, and a person with a Narcan in their pocket or purse can save a life. That's 
That's a great thing. I just want to say also for our, for our 13 year old, you're now an ambassador. You're, you are taking this information tonight and you're going to spread it to your friends in the community. There's no, you have um, all the information that you need to know and you can tell people the truth so there's no misinformation. So if you see a friend at a party about to take a plate, like, oh, you know, maybe you shouldn't take that, that might have fun selling it, or maybe let's go do this, or maybe let's do that, or let's, let me, if you're gonna use it, at least let's, let me make sure I have this Narcan ready, let me go get that first, or something like that. But having this information enables you to save lives of your friends around you, and so maybe you may never touch a drug in your whole life, and I hope that that's true but you can't say the same for your friends. And maybe right now you don't know how important your friends are gonna to be to you, but moving forward, that's gonna be your entire world. And so being here tonight means that you can probably save a few of your friends' lives. Okay, I guess we have two left, and then we've got a couple more slides real quick. But uh, here's a question, can dogs smell it? And this may be outside your, this is again in, in a law enforcement related question, but can dogs smell fentanyl? Tasteless and odorless, so the dogs are amazing. Maybe they can. I'll Google it if you want. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm sure they can, uh, in one way or another. Oh, last question here is: What is a white paper? Other than uh, it's a paper that's white. No. Um, <laughs> so a white paper is uh, it's like a it's like a statement that's official and. Uh, it's, sent to um, convey a specific message. You would see it come from like um, the White House. They'll put out a white paper. Um, or it could be you know, from some, any other organization can typically put out a white paper. Um, Chef, question. Go ahead. Uh, just a, a follow-up question <clears throat> for Dr. Lang. I remember your term, bad decision, okay? I think that dominates this whole activity. This, this get together is for teens, okay? And making a bad decision comes at that one moment uh, where you're in a, at a party with somebody or you're, you're with your boyfriend and he says, hey, how about it? And so I'd, I'd be interested in what are the, what are the statistics for that as a source of the problem itself? Uh, or, is it, or is the main reason for all this addiction, individuals just taking this stuff? Or is that that social pressure, I think that's the most important that we need to deal with here. Maybe you can expand on that. So I think the primary focus on teens is that they're not really aware of the dangers and they're not aware that, you know, most everybody in this room, like I said, would say, I will never take fentanyl. It sounds awful. You, you know, right now I'll sign the paper, I'll never take it. But they might sign up for something else, right? Like trying, you know, like uh, experimenting with marijuana or ecstasy or these type of things. And they might think that that's safe, right? Because that doesn't kill people like fentanyl does. It doesn't sound so scary. But then they end up inadvertently ingesting the fentanyl because the dealers don't care if they spill a little fentanyl in or marijuana, or they don't care if they spill a little fentanyl in your ecstasy. They don't care what happens to you. And so I think that um, the main problem with teens is that they're experimenting with something, inadvertently overdosing and dying from the fentanyl that's contaminated in it. And they don't realize that that's the risk. You know, just everybody here, I will never take fentanyl, it's terrible. But you're gonna, if you experiment with any type of other drug, there's a risk that that fentanyl might be in it. Um, I think that's the main issue. The percentages of um, teens addicted to fentanyl who die from an overdose versus teens that die from an accidental poisoning, I don't know. I don't know the difference. But I would say that the majority of probably overdose deaths are people who are now addicted to fentanyl. And those are probably in an older age group than teens. So this is not an up-to-date statistic, just to add to Dr. Lynch, but I did have a slide with the CDC. And it looked at, again, my pessimistic view of why people die at which age groups. And if you looked at the age group between 15 and 24, um, unintentional poisoning comes up as one of the, the highest um, causes of death, right next to motor vehicle accidents. Um, and it's like of the you know 15,000 per I don't know um, 100,000 people population, 
6,600 or something like that. Um, so I don't know the, the exact, exact statistics, but that was a 2021 drawback from what they were able to, to field and look at, you know, either the obituaries and, and so forth. And it doesn't tell the whole story because it says unintentional poisoning. So you don't know what it all means and it's grouped up with narcotics and everything, but that's a good rough estimate. It, it's definitely one of the top causes. The other thing, it's uh, increasing. Um, I think the number is somewhere around 20% a year. It's huge. So even though we're giving out Narcan to the communities, um, the, the, the crisis is just unbelievable. It's just increasing every year more and more and more. I think it was, uh, was 111,000 um, died last year. And this year it's going to be even more. So. Okay. Are there any more questions this evening? And I think that because we held you all in your seats and, and kept you uh, riveted here this evening, I'm gonna I'm gonna look to Pastor Mike and the extension board to see if we might be able to do this once a year. And you can tell your your friends and neighbors about this uh, type of uh, workshop so that the teens in the future, the, the 11 year olds have become 12, the 12 year olds have become 13 on, and, and uh, onward uh, can come and attend this event. Uh, I'd like everyone to give a round of applause to our distinguished panel this evening. Thank you all very, very much for taking time out of your busy schedules. You shed such great information uh, with all of us this evening, and I know we're going to save lives. We've got ambassadors that are 13 years old, and we have parents that now know uh, the dangers of this drug. And so, again, I wanted to thank you. Um, we have a QR code. We'd like your feedback, either the handwritten evaluation form and or if you hold your phone smartphone up to the QR code, you can fill out the two minute uh, feedback evaluation and let us know how we did this evening and we'll take uh, your feedback and see how we can improve it next time. Uh, some people that I'd like to thank and organizations, obviously Torrance Memorial, an affiliate of Cedar sinai uh, Beach Cities Health District, Emory and Nicole for helping us get the word out and bringing the Narcon this evening, of course, Torrance Memorial brought, I think, 400 boxes over there. Um, our champions at Miracosta High School, administrators, the student leadership, uh, Manhattan Beach Middle School, uh, MBUSD, members of the PTA, Chambers of Commerce, our mayor, Richard Montgomery, and the Manhattan Beach City Council that endorsed attending this event this evening. And I wanted to thank our many volunteers at the Manhattan Beach Community Church. A huge round of applause for all of you. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to thank Candy Duncan, whose idea it was to put this event on. Candy, stand up and take a bow. Thank you, Mom. And thank each of you for joining us this evening. Good night.